Thanks, Nick. I, I appreciate it. Indeed. Today's guest is from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. He has a boxing record of 5-1 and one and an MMA record of 14-4. and four. He was a member on the 11th season of The Ultimate Fighter and fought in the UFC. He's a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and a black belt in Muay Thai. I always said we were the two toughest Knicks in Calgary. Welcome to the show, Nick Ring. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, brother? Oh, I did that without God. breathing. <laughs> <laughs> you caught the COVID. <laughs> How you been doing? I've been very well. Yeah, a bit of a change of pace. I mean, for uh, the last five years or so, I've been mostly just uh, just doing my real estate. So I don't train a whole lot. I do uh, I do coach a few people, you know, okay. just... It, it's more of a classroom type of setting. You know, I'm doing these uh, Winter Warrior uh, groups. So, I mean, a lot of these guys are a little older. And you know how it is in, as an athlete. I mean, usually you start the kids young. Yep. You know, you take them through the paces. You know, they, they get to be in, I guess, money-making age. You know, and uh, then they just yep. have their career, right? So, a lot of the guys that I'm teaching right now, these are guys that are past, way past their prime. You know, they... Their mom didn't put them in karate when they were a kid. Yeah. You know, like to try it out. And they have a fight at the end. So, I mean, basically, uh, we're talking, uh, it's a 22-week program. You know, you, these guys start off with no martial arts experience. A lot of them are in the 30-plus area. You know, and then at the end of the 22 weeks, they have a MMA fight with one of the other guys in the program. So, it's uh, a live fight. Yeah, we match them up according to uh, weight age skill level and uh, you know what honestly these make great fights uh, we've d we've done two seasons now we're in season three let me get on season four <laughs> come on up to <laughs> hey, you remember eight years ago you trained me in petway i know it was awesome <laughs> you know i still tell people about today you're probably walking around about 195 uh i was just around 235 240 then and Dude, I just tell people how you kick my ass. Like we we rolled for three minutes, and you tapped me out, I believe, six times in, in in three minutes. And one of the most impressive things to me was you had put me in a um, what was it? Um, you had wrapped your legs around my head, and I was like, I'm about to pick you up and slam you. And then you put your arm around my uh, the back of my knee, and I couldn't stand up. And I tell people, man, it's all leverage and, and it's all skill. And, but you moved and you flowed through everything like, like it was riding a bike. I had to think mentally, okay, what am I going to do next? Where am I going to go next? What am I, where am I going to put my hand? Where do I need to put my foot? What do I need to – can you talk a little bit about that in, in the mindset of, of teaching these – like you said, you got a 22-week program. Like teaching someone to fight is almost like you have to do it. You have to cut the brain off and just let your body react. You're absolutely correct. You know, I, th I think with your football, too, you can probably relate. But you do these patterns over and over and over and over again to where they're, you don't even think about it. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's the same way with a fight. Like, these guys, uh, you know, they're brand new. You know, like, in the beginning of training, you know, there's a lot of a, you know, you, they consciously have to think about what they're doing kind of yeah. thing. Um, the basics are relatively easy to grasp. Then you got to wrap it out, wrap it out, wrap it out, wrap it out. So, I mean, they, they do so many reps by the end of it that by the time they get to a fight, you know, they're not thinking about what to do anymore. They're, you know, it's like you're teaching a person how to punch. I mean, they got to think about it hard, but, you know, after you've thrown thousands and thousands of them, it's just, okay, punch. Now you're focusing a little bit more on strategy. You know, how do I, how do I employ this, you know, to get to the end goal, which would be a knockout or a decision. It really depends on the physical attributes of the uh, fighter, right? Yeah. Some guys have natural knockout power. Some guys, they're not going to knock guys out, but they can make it a fight. You know yeah. what I mean? They can take it to the end kind of thing. And so, I mean, it's going to be a little bit different for every guy that you're coaching, you know, like what the, what are we trying to accomplish here that's, you know, going to lead you to success, right? Is this, you know, is, is it going to be a decision? And you're, every fight you're planning on finishing the fight, but some guys are able to finish, uh, finish quicker, right? They're able to uh, explode. So, I mean, you got to kind of cater to your, uh, cater to your student a little bit. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, some muscle memory, because the fact is, you get into a fight, um, if you have not done your reps, and you don't have that baseline conditioning and all that, I mean, the first time you get hit, you know, I mean, you might not even remember where you are. This is where your body's got to take over. Your uh, your nervous system has got to, it's got to take over for when you can't think anymore. And uh, trust me, when you get into a fight, it's just, especially the first one. The first one is way, it's probably the hardest one out of any that you could do. Because um, my, my very first fight, uh, I, I took that thing on three days notice. Wow. You know 17 years old and you know what i was gung-ho i wanted to get in there kind of thing i lost the match right <laughs> devastating <laughs> devastating you know it was like you know everybody's got this like image in their mind on how good they would do if they ever got into a fight you know like if i got really angry you know i just punch him i'd knock him out and it's just not like that you know like you get you get good at fighting by getting in there a lot so it's hard to explain that to a person. It's like, well, you know what? Take your first fight. Um, you might win, you might not, okay? So don't get too wrapped up in that, right? I mean, the whole point is just getting in there multiple times and you develop a skill set, right? Like uh, you, be, you become at ease with those uh, those feelings, like those that anxiety and everything. Yeah. And you literally are putting your ego on the line, right? Because it's never the way you envision. I mean, you go to punch the guy... <laughs> You're going to miss. You're not going to hit as hard as you think you can. You know what I mean? You hit him like 50 times. The guy's still standing. And it's like, well, you got to deal with that, right? Like, uh, yeah, the mental hurdles through the fight. The mental hurdles, right? So this is really what separates the men from the boys, right? Uh, yeah. After and 22 it, weeks, are, like, do you see, like, good fights or? We see excellent fights. And, you know, like, it's always on a continuum, right? Because, yeah. like, like I was saying, we match the guys up according to age, skill level, like all that kind of stuff. So, and you know what ends up happening is uh, when we match these guys up, you know, uh, like if we were to put the really good guy with the really bad guy. That's not a very good fight. It's not good for it's not good for the show either. But you know, sometimes you put the less skilled guys together, and they end up having a great, great fight. Like I mean, it's <laughs> like it, it, it's it's perfect. You know. Yeah. The good guys together they have a great fight you know so yeah i, I don't know they has anybody they, ever gotten in and said you know what i can't do this yes yes because yes. i remember when when you closed the gate on me and when you closed the octagon on me and petway i was looking and i was like i really feel like a caged animal right now like there's no way out at this point you're committed to doing this and we wasn't even punching we were just grappling you guys are grappling, yep, yep. Right, and it just, it seems like such an odd world to be in, to be in there looking across and know this person wants to hurt you. You know, I, I, I think, like, in the pro, within the program, um, we usually have, I don't know, maybe three or four that just kind of drop off. Like, they're just like, okay, you know, this is not going to be for me. But most of them do stay. So, I mean, we, we average about 40 people per program, something like that. You know, we'll get, like, three or four maybe drop-offs, you know. Uh, the rest are committed, you know. They, they, they go in there, they do it. So, I mean, we do a lot with the mental and everything. Like, yeah. uh, look, guys, this is, <laughs> this is nothing the way you think it's going to go. <laughs> you know, like, uh, and trust me, on fight day, everything's going to go wrong wrong you're gonna wake up feeling you know tired or sick or oh you know what like my head's not into it you know these are normal feelings and you know trust me everybody goes through it you know like you, you just got to basically strap on and do it and as you're walking up to the cage that is by far the most nerve-wracking part of the experience you, you walk in the cage cage door closes you're staring at your opponent and there's just no, there's no backing out at this point. I mean, everybody's there. You got your friends, you got your family. And, you know, like, uh, after that first punch is thrown, everything goes out the window. You know, uh, you just, like, you're just relying on motor memory. Yes. And uh, it's never as bad as people feel. Like, I think the psychological component of it is probably the toughest. I mean, physically, you're going to be very, very tired. But, I mean... When I compare like fighting to various other sports, I mean, I, I don't think it's overly that dangerous, you know, like, uh, yeah. 
but psychologically it's a lot like I think it's probably one of the toughest things because you know if you look at a, say a downhill skier yeah you know like that is by far way more dangerous <laughs> yeah you hit a tree you're done a skier. <laughs> you know it's not psychologically as scary though as getting into a fight with a with the man standing across the cage with, from you you know like yeah because, I mean, like, literally, when you're fighting a guy, you're actually putting your ego on the line here. And, you know, it's just, I don't know. There's got to be something there just evolutionarily, like, evolutionary biology or, you know, it's just, I mean, this is, this is your whole reputation, you know? Like, you're putting yourself on the line, and, I mean, everybody's watching. I mean, it's just, it's sort of like the fear of public speaking, you know? Like, I, yeah. I think people are more scared of public ski speaking than they would be skiing down a hill as well. Which one's more dangerous? <laughs> yeah. And, like, when I was a kid, I used to always be like, when I lost, I'd be like, well, I can win the fight. I was ready to fight you. Like, if you could beat me, I was ready to fight you. And But if you fight for a living and you lose, what's next? You got to be like, I got to shoot you or something because I can't beat you. <laughs> like, I always get, I always look at people that get mad at the end of fights. And I'm like, well, it ain't like you can do anything to the person who just kicked your ass. Like, <laughs> you, <had> your <laughs> you just got to take it because if you go over there and shove him, he's going he to beat you worse. <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a funny thing you say about wanting to fight the guy who beat you. Be, you know, I'm, I'm going to bring up a book. It's called The Winner Effect. Okay. It's a, it's a great, great book. You got to pick it up. You got to read it. You're going to see this phenomenon, like, everywhere in society. And that's, in fact, what this guy does uh, with the book. He... He starts off a few examples. He goes through like cuttlefish, you know, and uh, so he's talking about like basically uh, different strategies these uh, animals will use to, I, I guess, get get what they want. Like some of them will, uh, I guess, transform kind of into a fighter type of thing, but it's a high risk, high reward strategy. Whereas some of the other ones will, they'll adopt more of a kind of a passive, uh, I guess, existence. Like they'll resemble females, they won't have as many offspring as the, you know, high testosterone ones, but oh, wow. they, they will reproduce just by hanging around the females. Whereas the ones that take, adopt the high risk strategy, they'll have more children, but they're also more likely to get killed. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, you know, then, then he goes into an example of, uh, he's talking about like Mike Tyson and everything. And uh, he's talking about the winner effect. Like basically the more you win, the more likely you are to win in the future, you know, because like there's a few things that happen to the brain. It's like your, your testosterone goes up, the dopamine goes up and the neurology of the brain itself, it just, it, it kind of um, reverts to that of a winner. I mean, these, these past experiences of winning, you know what I mean? makes you more likely to win in the future just because, uh, you know, your body just, it goes through the motion. But he also talks about the downward spiral. You know what I mean? Like a lot of times when you're training, you know, uh, your your winning is associated with like how hard you've been training and yep. uh, develop a certain amount of skill. So what happens with a lot of guys is uh, they start getting a little lazy. I mean they they've won so many times that they, you know they're they're not working quite as hard. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, and uh, you know they're still getting good results, but you know the second they run into that one opponent who might be a little hungrier, you know they 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 lose. I mean they lose a lot of confidence. And it starts turning into a downward spiral, and it's sort of yeah. like a loop effect, like that kind of thing. What was uh, what was neat about this uh, book is he took this uh, he took this a step further, and he was talking about like uh, the winner effect on a um, on groups. You know, mm -hmm. and he was talking about soccer players, right? Uh, you know, he said statistically, the soccer teams and everything that wear red, you know, they win more often than the ones that you know wear blue. Like the blue is a more uh, submissive color, yep. where red is a more dominant color, and it it it. Uh, I mean it. Uh, I mean it's the same with like women and fertility. I mean they they get redder like when they're you know when they're ready to breed and all that. That's that's why women wear lipstick and you know it it, it accentuates all that stuff. But it's also a color of violence and uh, you know domination, right? Whereas the blue color that's more of a submissive one. But he was talking about like with the soccer players, you know, they'll go head to head, they'll play their game. You know, the team that wins, their testosterone will go up while the team that loses, it will go down. Go down. And wow. you can see this, 
um, even after a fight, you can, you can, without any sound on, you're just looking at, you know, the two combatants, which one is, which one won? You can tell the guy who won, his chest is out, you know, he's, he's, he's eye to eye kind of thing. And the loser is just a slight little, you know, you can see that defeat, you know, yeah. but then he was talking about, it's not only in the soccer player teams that win that their testosterone goes up, but the fans of the team that win their testosterone also goes up <laughs> oh wow you know? so it's a gr- so you're affecting multiple people you're affecting multiple people i mean you're like and you can see this actually and i you i'm sure you know this but you know like when your team wins you know your fans they're elated you know they got a nice little boost of dopamine they got a big boost of testosterone the team of the losing that the the fans of the losing team i mean their testosterone goes down and you know what's funny, but you see this with the soccer riots. Well, your team just lost. <laughs> Their team just won. Well, you want to get that testosterone back. Let's start a soccer fight. If I can beat up a fan of the <laughs> winning team, I can get my testosterone back. You can get it so back. <laughs> wow. That's you know, awesome. awesome. Yeah. I know you read books, man, but I didn't know you was reading stuff like that. What's the name that- of that book again? The winner effect. I, I can't remember who the author was. Uh, I got to I got to back here somewhere, right? I'm definitely but gonna get that book, man. I gotta see that. It's fascinating. You're you're gonna see this phenomenon at all levels because he even goes into politics and just uh, how power, you know, among these uh, guys. Like some some guys, they get into power, it goes right to their head and they become tyrannical. Whereas others, they get power, but they're a little bit more, you know. Yeah, submissive you know, to everyone. Not, just. Uh, abusing it you know yes. what i mean you know and this is kind of a brain difference between each one of these guys but you, you got to read the book you're gonna you're gonna be fascinated because once you once you get these concepts down you're gonna look around and you're gonna see it happen everywhere wow i'm definitely gonna get the book and you know it, it's crazy you bring all that up because it really what i what i do this podcast for is to really see the journey right how so many people will be so close to breaking through and a couple bad things happen and they just fall off or they quit, right? Your journey wasn't easy to get to where you got to. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit, but just hearing about this book, if you can pile on wins in life, you got a much better chance to be successful, right? You can win the day, win the day. You know, a lot of you hear that a lot, win the day. You know, what does that mean for a lot of people? How do I win the day? And I guess people have to, create that mindset where they're going to go win the day. And if you get enough victories, it's going to propel you to do more and be better. That is, uh, that is, you know, what you said right there, that's very, very, very true. You know, and it's, it's funny. I, I see this happen a lot with people, you know, they, uh, you know, they make a goal that's, it's too crazy. You know what I mean? Yep. They fall short of it you know, they become, they lose confidence in that, right? Yeah. You really want to get those goals to be, you know, just in line with something that you can achieve and then you stack them up, right? Yeah. You know, and I found this with uh, training fighters. Uh, you know, there was a few guys that I trained where I think we put them in deep water too fast. Mm. In like, um, you know, I think one of the, I think a good recipe here is like, uh, you know, you got an athlete, you know, you kind of want to give them, you know, three easy fights, one hard one, three easy fights, one hard one. So you're kind of like, you're step laddering it, you know, you're just, you're building them up, right? You see uh, organizations do that though. Like even with Michael Page, right? How much time they've taken with Michael Page to, before they threw him in there with some of the top guys. Yeah. Well, and you know, it's like, like with a fighter, I mean, you're trying to develop their, their bloodthirst a little bit, right? Uh, you know, you get, you get them with guys that are, you know, um, guys that they can beat, you know? Um, like, you want, you want them to get practice knocking guys out. Yeah. You know what I mean? And after they've done that, like, over and over and over again, I mean, by the time they hit somebody who is – really really tough themselves i mean they've got it embedded in their brain that hey i'm gonna go in there and i'm gonna knock them out right i mean they've got so many reference experiences yeah to uh to that effect that yeah i mean like this guy's actually he's like a hardened criminal at this point right you know what i mean he's able to 
you know, he's, he's done it enough times that, you know, he could easily do it to this other guy who's also very good, you know? So it, it, it turns into a real good fight, right? But you throw these guys in way too early, you know, it's like their confidence can be hurt. It's very hard to get that back, you know? Yeah. I look at a fighter, um, you know, like George St. Pierre, for instance. Like, yep. uh, he's one of the few fighters where, you know, and same thing. He had the winner effect going up, right? He won the title the first time. Remember that? Yeah, then he got knocked out. Then he fought Matt Serra. Yep. You know, for a lot of guys, that would have been, you know, kind of the beginning of the end. You know what I mean? Yep. George George is a little bit uh, special because, you know, he lost the title. You know, he should have been going down. He worked really hard and he he, he got back. You know what I mean? So it's pretty hard to reverse because I don't see that happen with a lot of guys. You know, like, uh, I think he's kind of a special athlete in that that sense because, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's interesting. I mean, you can turn it around, but it's very hard, you know? When you come back off of a loss, like the mindset then has to change. Do you think you have to work twice as hard or, or is it more of a mental hurdle than to physically get back in and, and fight again? Like when you talk a, about that spiral, downward ab- spiral. Absolutely. And you know what? Like that, that's another thing with athletes is, uh, you know, when they lose – um, they take it very personal. You know, it's like, well, I lost because I suck. Or, you know what I mean? Like, that, that's yeah. a bad mentality. I mean, and I don't see that with anybody who's, a, you know, kind of a high performer. I mean, they, they, they don't take it as personally as uh, some others do, right? So, I mean, they're just like, well, you know, I tra- changed my strategy and I, you know, if I do the right things, you know, like, they gotta, they, you got to go in with a clean slate every time. And you know this is a different day, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do things different, right? And uh, I don't I don't know, but yeah, I know it's definitely a mental thing. And but the problem is too, you know, you get on a two or three fight lo- losing streak, it's very hard to you know get that confidence back, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's very fascinating. You know, um, even when you bring up the political side, like I said, I don't like talking about politics, but like the state of the world right now with the with the protesters. I know, I know kind of where you stand. I see some of your posts and things like that. Um, what I say, the agitators. There's so many people with agendas that it outshadows what really is needs to happen. Um, and, you know, you people say Antifa, uh, George Soros, um, all these other people, uh, the police, um, Everybody has an agenda, right? I see one video, the cops are standing there and they say, hey, we're good guys. Yeah, somebody did wrong, but we're good guys. And for me, it's like, okay, if you're good guys, just stand up and say, people are wrong. And um, I don't know if you got a chance to hear the, the new Dave Chappelle. He, he put out something uh, this morning and he talks about um, – what's his name, Donor, Dorner from uh, California. And, and what happened was, I think his name is Chris Dorner, but what happened was, is Chris, he was the uh, black guy, he went to the military, became a cop, and then he ended up killing cops. And he wrote a manifesto, and you can go back, this was back in 2013. Um, and what happened was, he was on a call with a, um, a white lady, and um, she kicks the perpetrator in the head after he's already arrested. Um, he files a complaint against her. He's then fired. He went through every step of the way to, um, to do it the right way, right? Hey, why did I lose my job? I did what I was supposed to do. I am supposed to protect and to serve. And he did everything the right way. And then when everything failed, He wrote a manifesto how he's going to declare war on the LAPD. End up killing two. Dorner was a, was he a cop himself? Yes, he was a cop. He was in the military. Then he became a cop. And And did he kick a girl? No, no. The girl was his partner. The female was his partner. And he arrested a, a black male. And she kicks him in the head after he's already arrested. Right. I got And he filed a complaint on his partner. Yep. Right. And um, 
so then he filed, filed warfare on the LAPD. He ambushed two cops, killed them. Um, and that's the thing I hate. You should never kill innocent people. Or, I mean, yeah. nobody deserves that. Everybody, everybody deserves their right in court. Put it that way. Saddam Hussein got his day in court, right? Um, and so he ambushed two cops, killed them, went to another cop's house, killed his daughter, and then they found him in the woods, right? Okay. The thing is, for me, it's not to justify what he did because shooting cops just to shoot cops that done nothing wrong is, I mean, shooting anyone is, is wrong in my view. And I'm not going to try to justify what, what Chris Dorner did, but just the mindset you have to go through that you feel like you did everything right in your life. When you went to the military, you fought for your country, you did everything right. Becoming a police officer to serve and protect in your own country. And then to be fired because you stood up for what you thought was right. And I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna assume the lady did not get fired, like the uh, no. woman cop. No. No, of course not, right? Yeah, you know what, it's funny. We've, we've got all these systems set up, you know, supposedly to, I don't know, it, it looks official, like, oh yeah, we've got a process and this and that, but, I don't know. It's it's not always. It doesn't always seem fair. You know, yeah. like you you try to do everything right, and you know, like they say, no good deed goes unpunished, right? Yeah. yeah. And it's 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 just very hard because I think it's a it's a stance where I feel like we all need to stand up for for good, right? Against the looters, against the rioters, against the Absolutely. people that's against the people that's causing issues, against the bad cops, against bad people in general. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. I want to ask you one political question. I wanted to stay away from this, but I just feel like I'm compelled to do it. Do you feel like the government is set up to divide, divide us? A little bit. You know, I'm, I don't know. It's just, <clears throat> I feel that certain people in the government i mean they make political hay off of dividing people yeah you know like uh they're always they're always looking for um i don't know try to pander to certain voters or whatever like yeah. by by i'm angry you know and I, yeah. I don't think i don't think that's right you know i think it's i think it's wrong you know people you know and it they can get everybody fighting each other. You know, I mean, it takes the attention off of them, which I think that's where our attention needs to be is on the politicians and exactly. not fighting amongst ourselves. And, and I think that's where they keep us now. And, you know, I know you, you, you're deep into American politics, right? And um, your, your stance on American politics like, where'd you get fascinated about American politics? Have you always been that way? Or just to give a little was, background to everyone about it. I was, uh, I was born there. Okay, I didn't know that. Yep, yep. I was born in Iowa. You know, I uh, come from an American family. But, you know, most Canadians are obsessed with American politics. So that's not even, you know, the, here's the thing about Canada is um, everything that happens down there in the states that affects, affects us yeah you know like we're our uh you guys are our number one trading partner so that's about you guys represent about 75 percent of our you know cross-border trade so i mean we've got we've got trade agreements with other countries but by far you know our our economics is completely dependent on you guys yes you know like that, that's where most of our goods go to that goes straight down south right uh you know, any policies that you guys come up with, I mean, you know, ultimately it's, it's going to be, we, we have to, uh, we have to respond to what happens with you guys. You know what yeah. I mean? So and I, like all Canadians are obsessed with American politics. There's very few Canadians that are, you know, like even bother with the uh, Canadian politics. Yeah. It's, it's just so fascinating. Like, cause I, I look at it, and, you know, Fox News is Republican. Uh, CNN is Democrat. And you hear so much far left, far right. And I was thinking about a question. 
if someone came out right now to run in this election and they took the top three Republican things they stood for that you stood for and the top three Democratic stances that you stood for, because I don't think nobody just a hundred percent. You can't say, I don't like anything the Democrats do or I don't like anything the Republicans do, but if they were kind of down the middle and they took the top three of each and they ran, do you think they would get, um, you think the Republicans or Democrats would let that person run? Well, I, I don't know what you mean there. Like, I mean, what the, what, well, I mean, like just I'll, like the top three issues, like, you know, what, what issues make you Republican or what makes you Democrat, right? If you took your well, top three, like, this is why I'm a Democrat or this is why I'm a Republican. The way I, the way I view the Democrats, like, I, I am a conservative. Yep. Like, I, I feel that people, they do best when they take personal responsibility, work hard, and, you know, just be a good person, basically. Yep. You know what I mean? Um, like the underpinning of that is just personal responsibility. You know, like I, you know, I choose what I do with my time. You know, I choose how many hours I'm going to work. I, you know, I, I, I make good decisions in my life and I'm yep. going to, I'm going to get a good result. You know, and I, I don't think that's a, you know, I, I just, I feel like with the, so that's an internal locus of control, you know, yeah. on the liberal side, it's sort of like, well, the way I feel the liberals are is they're like, well, I'm a victim and I'm going to make everybody else responsible <laughs> for, for my life. Right. So where, where I part from the uh, liberals is, you know, they, they want, uh, I don't know. They just seem like they want handouts all the time. Right. And, uh, you know, they want to increase the size of the government, you know, I want to decrease the size of the government, you know, and put more of that responsibility on individuals, you know, to, you know, take, take their life back and, you know, do things that are going to create a better, you know, better society, you know, and I yeah. think that all starts with individual responsibility. You know, you want your neighborhood to be good, you know, well, pick up the trash. Uh, don't, don't, don't wreck things, you know, um, uh, help your neighbors, you know, like that kind of thing. So, I, I don't know. It, it starts with you, though. I mean, get your yeah. own house in order, you know, and uh, don't worry about society. I mean, worry about yourself and make 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 your own life good, you know. Yeah. And in doing so, you know, like there's going to be some effects from you getting your own house in order that are going to permeate through society. If everybody is just focusing on themselves and you know uh, getting getting their own issues and clean cleanups done, yeah. you know it. It's a, it spreads out throughout the community, you know, but when you're not focusing on yourself and you're just like focusing on what other people need to change, you know, it's a, like, well, you know, like there's, there's nowhere to go with that. It, it, it doesn't work. Yeah. No, I, I totally get that. And um, the only thing that I haven't, it's not an issue, but this, I wanted to, it's what was created, like the mentality of, of, certain amount of people in a small distance that that have nothing that created a mentality of dog eats dog right even when i got to canada i used to say you know the u.s is just dog eat dog canada is more everybody gets a more of a piece but the u.s created a dog eat dog world where everybody's willing to step on everyone to get to what they want um, but at the same time i believe over generations um there's a it's been well documented that it's not in favor of for some as it is in others. And it's not always a race thing, right? If you're poor and you're white, you get treated the same way. Right. Yeah, the guys so, in the trip. Yes. So, yeah. you know, that's, that's the only thing, like, I see what I've done. Right. Um, I see what you've done and, like, yeah, we, there's certain people that are going to overcome and overcome. Um, but there's certain things that just makes it very hard for me to get on that stage. I would love to be at a position in a platform to be like, that is a hundred percent the way everybody should want it. Everyone have an opportunity to be great. Everyone have a same, op not the same, everybody have the same opportunity to do what they want to do in life. 
but I believe through redlining and I believe through things of the past uh, from Democrat and Republican. I mean, yes, Democrats lie to get black votes. I'm, I'll never, I mean, they put on a clown show to do it, right? Uh, Republicans, yep. Republicans, right. they, yep. they do things um, that I feel like don't help the, the black race either, right? So I feel like I'm not on either side, mm. right? I feel like they give us two choices then I don't like either one, right? Why are we the people okay with who you give us? That's my stuff. Well, Does that make sense? Well, I don't, with, with the, usually the guys that are running for president, I mean, these are, these are guys like congressmen and senators, right? Yeah. So, I mean, they've, they've got a history in office, so I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just going to assume that they got voted in by, you know, like the people in their district. But I got to say, like, I don't, I don't like a lot of what I see even from, you know, the Republicans. I don't like what I see from the Canadian conservatives. I mean, honestly, I think they're way too <laughs> liberal for my, my tastes. But, <laughs> you know, like they don't go nearly far enough. I mean, I'd like to see a lot less spending. I'd like to see a lot, you know, just, uh, I guess, more community-based you know, like uh, alternatives. Like I, I don't like the whole top down, like uh, you've got, you know, a guy from a, you know, district who's a long ways away from you, you know, making decisions on your behalf, like yeah. at all. I mean, I think it's more community based because, you know, like the second you get into a community, I mean, you're going to see things that somebody far away is never going to see. Yeah. You know, like uh, can't come up with blanket policies for like one size fits all. It doesn't. You know, you go neighborhood to neighborhood, there's going to be different solutions that are more appropriate for one area town versus another, right? So yep. I'd just like to see a little bit more decision making at the local level, you know, than from a top down government, right? Because it, it never works. I mean, they always, uh, they always talk about like what uh, they're going to do, but you know, it just can't work, right? Yeah. Uh, you, you, don't have, you don't have the feet on the ground. Yeah, I, I apologize for bringing up politics, man. Like I told you before, I don't think you could ever we could ever solve it, but I just, something at that moment just wanted me to ask that question. And um, I don't want to put you on a spot like that and, and put it in a situation. Like, no, no, I, I, I mean, I, I enjoy, I enjoy discussing this, you know, and it's yeah. funny, you know, I'm on kind of the uh, philosophical, you know, end of it. I mean, I don't know all the moving parts here, but you know, I just, you know, from, uh, from the, philosophical you know end of it i mean i'm just thinking about like just again the personal responsibility and you know just get your own life in order don't worry about society so much you know i think some of that stuff will solve itself i mean there's yeah i mean i, I know you brought up like redlining and uh, that that was kind of a that was in the 60s with the insurance companies well just right? what just what no with, with housing so in the back yeah. in the day you couldn't get houses in certain neighborhoods so they created ghettos and and things like if you put two dogs in a house and you don't feed them one dog will eat the other dog right so when we look at black mm -hmm. culture and we look at what was created by the government regardless if it's democrat or republican if we look at what was created from slavery to after slavery, where you imprison black men, uh, the biggest things that you hear is, well, if there's more black fathers in the home, well, you lock them up, right? Or you're killing them. Or, you know, there were men, black men that went to war with the assurance that they were gonna get the same loans to get the same houses as the other men going to war. And when they got back, they were denied. You're talking about World War II then? Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah, so, okay. so the things that I look at it and I understand what you're saying. And I truly believe that like everybody should want to worry about themselves. But when you look at what's happening through the system for years and years and years and years, it has created a mentality of a people and a culture of a people that is not always right. Like you can't justify black on black crime because a cop kills a black guy, right? No. The black on black crime people people know that was it eighty over eighty percent people are killed by someone they know. Yeah, of course. right. So it's not like it's a far fetched thing. If you put if you put a group of people in this little bowl right here, 
and you don't give them anything, what else are they taught? Right? You well, didn't teach them anything. Now, they had to. So who who gives like, like who gives somebody something? Like is that something that you know? Do you mean the government gives them or? Well, I mean just like just like, like coming out of slavery. You know, you didn't teach them how to read. You didn't teach them how to do things, and everything self taught. And um, you're you're feening to survive, and you have these places in the world where people don't have an opportunity, right? The only opportunity out is to drug your own people or to um, be a criminal or do things like that. Is it right? No, it's not right. Am I justifying it? No, I'm saying that if everyone, if everyone started at the same start point, you would see a total difference. And we could actually say what you said is 100% right. Does that make sense? Yeah. But, but the, yeah. You got to look in context of the world. I mean, this is literally, you know, in fact, I think hierarchy, you know, it was actually much worse in the past. Yes. You know, than it is even. You know, I mean, you can go back to uh, medieval Europe. You know, I mean, you were born into a royal family or you were a serf. You, yeah. you weren't getting out. You know, I mean, the way, uh, the way that people got to judge, uh, you know, like I guess the free West is, you know, is a level of upward mobility. I mean, there's still, there's still like, um, I guess, hierarchies, but it's a lot easier to get, you know, up to that high level and it's a lot easier to fall down to the low level. I mean, you know, a lot of people too, they, they, they like <laughs> to blame the tent and say, oh, well, the 1% did it, the 1% did it. I mean, but I mean, the people at the 1%, I mean, they, they, people, they go through, um, they, you know, there's, there's not like a static 1% and a static 99%. I mean, yeah. you follow actual, like when people are doing that kind of a comparison, they're saying, well, okay, you know, this is just a, you know, this group never changes and this group never changes, but you follow actual individuals rather than categories of people you know, you'll see a very different picture. Yeah. You know, you're 18 years old, you know, you've never really had a job and you don't have a career. I mean, how much money are you making as an 18 year old? Not very much. Yeah. You follow that same individual, you know, at, by the time he's 30 years old, you know, let's just assume he's been in the workforce now for 12 years, you know, is he making more money than that 18 year old? Yes. You know, I mean, if you follow that individual to, 50 years old you know they um by the time you're age 46 you're actually making a lot more money you know that's that, that's the on average that's where you're making the most money you're ever going to make is about age 46 you know this is where you're at the height of your career you know a lot of these guys are actually in the uh, top 20 percent of income earners right before they start yeah. planning for retirement and all that you know like the, the, the kid who's 18, you know, he's, a, he's kind of at the lower income bracket. You follow that individual by the, by the time he's at his peak earning, you know, he's kind of in the top 20%. So the people, they move in and out of these brackets all the time. And by the time you're retired and you're not making any income, I mean, you're right back down, right? So yeah. I don't view um, these in like static categories. I mean, people, you know, they've got a lot more opportunity to move up and down now. If you come from a bad family and you've got no opportunity, you know, it's a little harder. I mean, say you're, say there's the emphasis, you know, by your parents and, you know, your extended family, it was not on education or, or whatever. I mean, maybe, maybe everybody's going on welfare or, you know, like that's very hard to break out of. I mean, you know, you gotta, you gotta be a special kind of person to do it, but I don't know where, uh, I don't know what, we, what you do. Is that, uh, I mean, me personally, I'd like to take away the welfare because I, I think it forces people to work. You know, like uh, if the government's not feeding you, you know, well, what are you going to do? You got to go out there and you have to shake the tree a little bit, right? So, but I don't know. I, these, these kind of problems, I mean, they're easy to come up. It's easy to talk about. Yeah. You know, it's hard to do. Yeah, because, you know, there's so many people that you affect and – you know, just looking at the other stuff, right? So, yeah, it's a it's a conversation that can go around in circles. I, 
I, you know, I, one other thing I just wanted to know from you is, like, you look at the state of Calgary right now, right? I, I was there 11 years. I love Calgary. Uh, you see the state of it with empty buildings downtown and people are struggling for the last five years, right? What's, what it needs to happen for Calgary to regain what it was and how can I help in that as well? Or how uh, can we know, help in that? Let's get rid of the city councilors. You know, they're, they're raising the property taxes. You know, like, I, I mean, they were shooting these things up like, <laughs> like 200% during a recession, right? That's why we've got these, uh, you know, empty buildings. You know, it's, it's hard to run a business, you know, like uh, it's too expensive. You know, um, I, I don't know, man. Like, I think that they, they need to get their spending under control. You know, like uh, quit, quit promising to do things that you guys can't pay for with, you know, and I mean, the thing is with a city, the only levers they've really got to uh, generate revenue is uh, they can ask the province, so the uh, provincial government for money, or they can raise property taxes. You know, what they need to do is quit spending in the first place, you know, then they don't have to keep the property taxes, uh, you know, so high. I mean, they need to fire a few people, you know what I mean? Like, just get the finances in order and everything without spending increases, you know, like, just, you know, and then let people get out of the way. That's what I want them to do. Get out of the way. Let people, let people make a living. You know, it's sort of like a, sort of like the difference between like a positive rights and negative rights. So a positive right is where, you know, you're promising people that you're going to give them material benefits. You know, and a negative right is you're just going to promise to not interfere with them. You know, yeah. negative right, that's kind of on the side that I lean. I mean, just, just stay out of my way and let me, let me live my life and let me, let me do things. You know, a positive right is, okay, well, what materials can you give me? You know, it's just, and I just want them to get out of my way and, uh, you know, quit interfering. Like, get rid of some of the regulations, you know, uh, um, don't raise my taxes, quit, quit stealing my property and quit, you know, just quit interfering, basically, right? Yeah. Well, one, I just want to uh, applaud you for, for sharing your views on, on that. Like I said, um, I don't well, want this to focus on that, right? Well, it's really sad what I'm seeing happen, you know, in the U.S. right now. I mean, I'm watching the riots, you know. Yeah. I know that, too. It's most of the protesters there, I mean, are not the rioters. Yeah, they're peaceful. I've been watching, I've been watching, like, uh, just, I guess, hidden camera, you know, people walking around. I mean, most of those guys, I mean, they're gen genuinely, you know, I mean, they're, they're genuinely just, protesting you know yeah. then you the other guys you know it's these looters you know like they're they're making up the minority but they're doing a disproportionate amount of damage you know they're paying and, people well then you got the antifa on top of that you know those guys you know i don't know how it's happening but you know you got these piles of bricks just showing up they got cops on tape like i can I send you videos they got cops on tape putting bricks out and they're in cages like they're perfectly placed. I mean, yep. um, but see that, that promotes the agenda, right? How, how pe there's a lot of money on the line right now. And this is yep. where the people need to see it. This is not about just rights. Like rights are changing every day, but there's a lot of money on the line. And if I say, how can I stop these protesters? If I have a lot of money on the line, I need rioters. I need people to do this so I can get the line. What, like, what do you mean by that? Who's got I mean, the you have corporations, you have the top 1%, you have other people. Everybody's got an agenda, right? So, like, okay, the protesters' agenda is we need legislation changed. The rioters' agenda is it could be from any, and I don't know, I'm not educated enough to know who exactly is, is creating these rioters and, and doing this stuff, but if I say I can't stop the peaceful protesters, right? Because that's an American right. But if there's rioting and there's, there's havoc being caused, now I can go down there and now uh, I can use force to uh, shut them up. up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. So they're using one for the other. And then some of the rioters are just people that just trying to take advantage of the situation and go steal. 
do you uh, do you think then it's I mean the purpose of their rioters like who do you think they're coming from and do you think they're anti is coming from because I mean obviously I think it's, it's coming from it's, both sides yeah I think I think, every, I think there's people on both sides with agendas to be able to like if this is against the police and police brutality which Colin Kaepernick kneeled for if this is all about police brutality and you know, injustice for everyone, right? This is not just a black issue. This is an injustice issue. Uh, you know, just seeing that video of the of the white kid getting shot in the hallway the other day by the cop. That was brutal. Right? This is injustice for everyone. This is not just, uh, like I said, a black and white issue. This is injustice for everyone. But when, it, when you say police brutality, and people start saying defund the police, and there's some educational stuff on defunding the police, and it's not breaking the police department up. It's not saying they're not going to pay them. I mean, there's a lot of people that say, I would say, pay the police more if you get rid of the bad ones, right? If you, yeah. if the police stand up for what, because teachers and police get paid the lowest salaries, and they have the hardest or the most important jobs. Mm -hmm. But then you got police doing it for the wrong reasons. Like I know cops from my hometown that get into policing because I got picked on in high school. Now they got some power. Yeah. Right, yep. right now I got some power. You can't mess with me. Right. So there's, yeah. there's some things that needs to happen um, with even becoming a police officer, I believe. But the moral, what I'm saying is, is that if we create destruction, then we can shut down all that talk. Mm -hmm. Right. So I believe some comes from the left, some comes from the right, but the people that get shit on is the people that's doing it for the right reasons. And the people that's out there peacefully protesting, that's marching, but getting shot in the face with uh, rubber bullets or getting tear gas. You know, you can't even use tear gas in war, but you can use it against your own people in the streets. Right. Yeah. What, uh, what do you think we should do then with the rioters then? Like, uh, lock them up. Yeah. Lock them up. Yeah, exactly. Lock them up. But I think that if you're, if you don't see a rider, like you can't just go to and start shooting police, like police, no. co police driving through protesters, videos of police driving through protesters. We're talking about police brutality and you're brutalizing people on national TV. Yeah. Yeah. Did you see that uh, old man who got shot too? The 75 yeah. year old, he got shot. Yeah. 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 And I think, yeah. I think Trump did wrong by, by comment on it. Some people can say it's fake, but as the president, you should never come out and say, like, unless you have 100% evidence, and I believe he might have been trying to set something up like that. He might have wanted to get pushed, but at the end of the day, he was still pushed. Like, you can come up to me and antagonize me, but I have a right to control myself, right? The cops didn't have to push him. No. Right. So at this point, and I believe if he wanted to fall, he would have put the helmet on. He'd have walked up to him with the helmet on and said, you know, start making and then fall, hit his head. And if he's going to fake it. Right. You're a fighter. You know about bleeding out of the ear. I mean, it could be it could be fake, could be real. But at the end of the day, I don't think unless the president can prove it, you even comment on it. <laughs> That's he called my on everything you, you can't control that guy it's crazy <laughs> yeah yeah mm -hmm. it's funny i mean i i don't know what it's like uh, where where are you right now are you in i'm in saskatchewan you're in saskatchewan yeah saskatchewan. Oh, okay so you're not even down there you, no 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 are, are you living down there no 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 okay. no, no 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 i'm I'm up in canada man i'm up here just hanging out uh, i got some family that peaceful protests and, and and things like that and they post videos every day and it's, it's peaceful right? There's a lot of people on the peaceful protest. And I think that's the way, that's what the soldiers fought for. That's what my granddad's fought for. I lost yeah. one granddad in Vietnam. My other one fought in World War II. They fought for us to have peaceful protests, not just black people, but uh, gendered, um, you know, gender equality, uh, everything, you know, saying so this is what our country stands on. When they wanted to open the country back up, and they stormed the building, the government building with guns, like, that's a protest, right? I'm not gonna knock it. If that's what you want, this would our come. This is what our country was founded on. Yeah, the First Amendment, right? 
right? Absolutely. Is to be able to voice your opinion. We don't all have to share the same opinion to live peacefully together. Absolutely. Right. I, we just want to get to the same place and that's to be happy in our own bubble. You know, people, they, they need to be allowed to talk. Exactly. hundred percent. You know, if, if you're not allowed to talk, well, you know, that's no longer a free country. Yes. A hundred percent, man. I, well, let's get into when you were, when you were a kid, like I said, I appreciate you. I'm sorry for bringing that up. Uh, oh no. You know what? It's, this is what, this is current events. You know, this is, yeah. uh, it's important. Like it, we, we see it differently, right? We see the world differently from different views. Like you said, you, you, you are, you are your, you know, Republican or whatever you want to call them. Um, I don't conservative. I was thinking conservative. I wasn't thinking like like that. Whatever you call them, I was thinking conservative. I could I couldn't remember liberal conservative. I'm a conservative, not a Republican. Okay, some you're of, conservative. Some of the some of the some of the Republicans are conservatives. Some of the Republicans are not conservatives. So you're you're conservative, I'm not a, a Republican. Not a Republican. Awesome. No, no. So you know it's funny. Uh, some of the, some of the, uh, I guess, Democrats, some of them are kind of liberal. Some of them are just straight up socialist. You know, it's a, I mean, they just happen to be under a democratic, uh, uh, I guess, banner, you know? So I'd say even some of the Democrats, they, they lean more conservative, but you know, it's just, I mean, that they, I guess it's just kind of a catch all. I mean, I'm a conservative first, you know, I'm not really a Republican, but, you know, that's where I would be. I mean, that's, I, I would have no choice but to vote for them if I, if I could, you know? Yeah. The Democrats, in my opinion, they're just, they're so far, so unhinged, you know, right now. They, they want to give everything to everybody. And I, I just feel like they're really uh, fueling the fire, you know, a little bit too much. I don't like, I don't like that, right? I, I, yeah. I just want, I, I want peace. I think that's what we all want, brother. <laughs> I think that's what we all want. There's just so many ways to get there. But when you were growing up, when do you, how long were you in Iowa? Oh, not long. I've, I've, I moved away when I was one years old. I've grown okay. up in, so I've been, I've been here my whole life. I, uh, I go down to the States quite frequently. You know, my entire extended family is down there. Iowa? Yeah, Iowa, California. Um, I've got a bunch in like Massachusetts, like uh, Boston area, all that. So okay, yeah, no, we're quite spread out. So I mean, I I visit and everything. So I know we're coming up on two years, and I just want to give a shout out to Jackie, your mother. Oh, uh, you know, you you were her her favorite football player. You know, bar bar none. You know, like yeah, you were her favorite. You know, and it's funny because, like, I, I was doing all this uh, UFC stuff and I was doing uh, – I've been doing MMA for a long time. You know, she didn't, uh, she didn't take me seriously until she saw a picture of me and you on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, wow, my son really is famous because he knows <laughs> Lewis. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. She's like, how did you beat him? I was like, oh, it's my buddy. She's like, wow. I, don't... <laughs> I went to her page earlier today and I just looked at some of the notes, uh, some of the messages and um, how she reached out uh, and we would talk about you. We would, we would direct message each other about you all the time. Um, oh. Some of the fights and look, let me pull it up real quick. It's actually, uh, where's that? She says, hey, Nick Lewis, thanks for support for Nick Ring. From his biggest fan, his mama. I know you're close to your mom. So figured it would be okay to give you a shout out. I don't want to embarrass Nick by posting a general message on the page. And he said, by the way, I'm a st big Stamp fan and, as well. And I love it when you have the ball. <laughs> and so that's what created um, a multiple year conversations. Um, we would talk before your fights. We would talk after uh -huh. games. And it was just so awesome to get to know her you know in that way and she would be like I'm on pins and needles when Nick's about to fight <laughs> and we talk uh, about Calgary and and in those days but 
I just felt compelled to, to, to give her a shout out on here because she was a wonderful woman and I know she loved you, man. And I know, uh, well, we're about two months from, from a year. So yeah. Yeah. Or yeah. two years. Yeah. Years, yeah. Well, yeah, that's, that's funny too. Cause I didn't know you guys were messaging, but, uh, no, that's really good to hear actually. Yeah. Yeah. I know. No, she loved you. So. Yeah. I loved her too, man. She was, she was awesome. Did you did you fight a lot as a kid, or what did you want to be when you were growing up? No, growing up, no, I wasn't. I wasn't a big fighter growing up. I got into kickboxing when I was fifteen. You know, for me, this was a entirely just a sport, a competitive endeavor. You know, I'm not a street fighter. You know, I'm not like that. I'm not an angry guy as far as a, you know. I'm getting into bar fights or anything like that. Uh, yep. I was never like that as a kid. I mean, you know, when I got into the gym, it was just, you know, like this is literally me playing a video game. Competition. You know, like uh, how do I do that? Competition. How do I make the best out of my body and everything and, you know, just achieve the goal. So, I mean, that's just, that's just who I am on that. I don't do it anymore. You know, like literally I just, I kind of put it down and I'm on to different endeavors right now. So like right yeah. now I'm just running uh, real estate, just got some properties and, you know, just trying to make the best of that, right? What did you want to be when you grew up though? When you were a kid, like what was the goal? Was it to fight? Or oh, gee. Yeah. I started fighting when I was 17 and I was okay. working jobs. I went to university, I was doing basically like biology. You know, I I didn't like that so much, um, and uh, this kind of like the fight career was going very well, so I was just like, okay, I think I'm gonna just focus this on this a little bit more. You know, I've only got so many so many years that I'm able to even do this at all. So yeah. you know, I, I kind of went a bit more all in on that. You know, in the meantime, I was just kind of doing some investing kind of stuff on the side. So you know, this is where I'm at right now. It was sort of like the transition was, I think it was fairly smooth, right? So while I was making money, I was just investing in it. And, you know, now, now that I'm not a competitor anymore, I'm just kind of mad. At yeah. It. You know what I mean? You gotta, I mean, the thing is too, with that, the athletes, I know a lot of athletes, uh, you know, when they're making money and everybody likes them and they're, you know, like they're Mr. Popular, I mean, they, they feel like it's never gonna end. You know, but yeah. it does end, you know, it does you, end. Gotta, you gotta have a, a, a life after sport, right? Yeah. Yeah. You made a statement once that said, um, you like the purity of MMA. what do you mean by that? It's a pure sport. You know, it's a, this is what the cavemen did. <laughs> they, they fought each other. One lived, one didn't. You know, it's, it's a very raw. You know, it's the same thing as the, I would consider sprinting. So that's a pure sport. Who can run faster? I would consider weightlifting. You know, that's a pure sport. It's a, it's a raw sport. Yeah. The fighting, that's a raw sport. And swimming, you know, like who can swim the fastest or whatever. You know, and then you got a, you got a bunch of other sports. Sports. There are more, it's like you know there's a lot of rules and everything and it's a it's like a construct yes you know what i mean they, they're based what around rules and stuff like soft yeah ball, and they're, they're they're enjoyable but you know it's not just based on like raw power right because yes. you know, all there's a whole thing there you know what i mean it's, it's yeah. a whole another universe i like how you so, explain I mean, that yeah, it's just kind of a yeah i really like how you explain that that's um I understand that, right? I'm faster than you. Let's prove it. Yeah. I'm stronger than you. Let's prove it. You know what I'm saying? I could I could beat you up. Like let's prove it. And then would you like more boxing or MMA? Did I what? What did you like more, boxing or MMA? Um, I like I loved boxing actually. Um I love jujitsu, I love kickboxing, I love MMA. I mean, everything I did, you know, what I liked about MMA was was that it was uh, like it, it was all encompassing you know the thing is you cannot just train MMA you know like that's not no. that's the way to get good you know you need to train boxing separately 
you need to train wrestling separately. You need to train, you know, jujitsu separately. And then you got to tie it all together, like within the context of a MMA fight, right? Yeah. Now MMA is a different world because not everything you do in a, say a boxing ring is going to work in an MMA fight. Not everything you do in a jujitsu is going to work in an MMA fight. Not everything you do in wrestling is going to work in an MMA fight, right? So, I mean, you basically got, you know, the MMA fight, that's, a, that's an overall strategy on how you can employ some of the tools you're getting from each one of these uh, specific disciplines, right? Yeah. I love boxing, but it's funny. I, I trained as a kickboxer for a long, long time. So yeah. I probably, by the time I actually got into boxing, and the only reason I did was due to a knee injury. I, I got into boxing. I had to wait something like a year and some for knee surgery. And I didn't want, didn't want to take that much time off. So I started doing boxing. I didn't think it was going to be nearly as hard as it actually was. You know what I mean? I was like, well, you know, I've kickboxed. I've had 30 fights as a kickboxer. You know, I, I know striking okay. But what struck me is with the boxers, I mean, like how many things they do. I mean, you've got two weapons there. you got your right hand and you got your left hand. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> but they do <laughs> a lot with a little, you know, I mean, they, they've just got it so dialed in, like, uh, you know, they've got all the little angles, they've got, uh, you know, they got the different kind of punches and everything, how to generate power, you know, they're very good with like distancing, you know, then you got like these little infighting zones. I mean, in boxing, like you can be in close with a guy and you're punching. You know, in an MMA fight, that doesn't really exist, you know, because, I mean, a lot of times you're grabbing onto the guy. And yeah. you got these different ranges and everything that, you know, unless you were actually doing boxing, I mean, you're never going to get to train it in an MMA fight. I mean, if you're just doing MMA and uh, you're spending your whole time just grappling the guy and trying to tie him up, I mean, you're never going to get good at boxing. Yeah. You, know, you need to train each one of these little things because – you're taking yourself to the extreme on, you know, each one of these little areas, right? Yeah. You know, boxing, I mean, I, I thought it was, you know, it was much more challenging than I thought it was going to be. I mean, I am an MMA fighter, you know, like in the context of that, I mean, that, that would be my sport. Yeah. But I don't know. I just, I, I, I absolutely love boxing. I, you know, I'm, I'll never be like, a, I'll never be one of the uh, greats there, but I mean, I can really appreciate it. You went uh, what four and one, five and one, five and one, yeah, yeah, five and one as a as a boxer, man. That's that's pretty awesome because it does take so much, too many, uh, so many different skills, right? And to fight people that train just boxing, because I'm pretty sure those guys, when you fought, weren't training MMA at the time either. They were just well, strictly I, boxers. I got a uh, I got a very bad reputation in the boxing circles. Um, <laughs> I uh, I know uh, I had a few times where I threw guys out of the ring and <laughs> <laughs> I got in trouble. I mean, to the point, you know, these referees they would come talk to me and they're like, "You you grab on them, you throw them, or whatever." I mean, they, you know, you're done. I'll I'll cancel the fight. That type of thing. So I I did develop quite a bad reputation. That's crazy. Well, let's talk about going into the tough house. You went into yeah. the tough house. What was the mindset? Like, even the process of getting started, like knowing that you got the call, that you're going on um, the Tough Series uh, for the UFC, what was that like to, to get that opportunity? You know, I, I grew up in Calgary. You know, I trained, at, uh, I trained at some good gyms, but, I mean, there's a small gym. So there's, no, there's, no, there's nobody who's doing anything like this, right? So yeah, um, I remember when I made it, and I remember walking into the Ultimate Fighter house. I was like, geez, I, I can't believe this. I can't believe I'm here, you know? Like, this is, it, it, it was a big, big, big thing. So, I mean, I, I wanted to just re represent my town and just, you know, just do my very best. So, yeah. but, you know, again, like, um, you know, you got to be just very careful not to psych yourself out. It's like, well, yeah. you know, I am here because I earned it. And, you know, like, you just need to, you just need to go with it and everything and don't question it too much. Don't overanalyze, you know, like focus on your training, just one little step at a time, you know, and you just put them together. So, I mean, like it was, it was, 
I really tried hard not to psych myself out and just like kind of stay focused on the goal here, you know? How did it feel to be the first overall fighter chosen? Tito chose you number one overall. Were you surprised? I was surprised. I was happy, you know? Um, I, I, I felt good about that, obviously. Um, yeah, I, I didn't want to disappoint anybody, right? So, I mean, yeah. as far as the training went, like, I showed up to training. I trained hard. I gave it my all. And, you know, I mean, I, I didn't like the results as far as, you know, I blew my knee out. I would have liked to, you know, continue. I mean, but, oh, well. I remember the conversation you had sitting outside on the show, and they still wanted you to fight through a torn ACL. Yeah. And you were like, well, everybody in the house knows I have a torn ACL. They're just going to yeah. kick me in the knee. Like, it's, like, if I didn't kick you in the knee, then I'm doing an injustice to myself. You know, here's the thing. That's a TV show. Yeah. And uh, they don't care about your career. You know, I care about my career. Yeah. You know, I want longevity. You know, with a torn ACL, if I go in there and I do it, I can damage my knee beyond repair. Yeah. You know, never fight again. Now, does the show care? The show doesn't care. You know, that's something I care about. I mean, I, I have to look out for myself here. Yeah. You know, I went, I left the show. I went and got my knee surgery. And, uh, you know, I was able to fight another day. I mean, this is just, you got to be smart. Yep. You know, don't, don't give in to the pressure. Right? It's just, you got to do what's right for you. Did you have 1% to say, yeah, I'll do it? Or you were just already said, like, I'm not I already, doing this? But, no, I, I was 100% out. I, I knew what happened. So I've had, uh, I've had five knee surgeries now. Wow. You know, so before that show, I had already had two. I knew exactly what happened. And I knew, I knew what was going to happen if I kept, you know, if I decided to be the tough guy and, you know, uh, try to fight through it. I knew I was just going to end up doing more da – like, first of all, I was going to lose the fight. Yeah. You know, damn it. So I wasn't going to walk out with a win. I would have had to fight two more fights after that, you know, to win the show. Yeah. So it's a, there's just no way. That's not uh, – you know, that's not a path to success, like – we're not even talking. I I just had one more fight to win. I would have had to fight two more fights to win the whole show. I you know doing that with a knee that needs knee surgery, it's not going to happen. Yeah, you don't even have stability. No, to you don't throw have punches or to defend takedowns or do anything at this point. No, they don't. You know. Yeah, you, you got to be smart here. You got to look after your own career. I mean, people they're not there to look at. That's your job. That's my yeah. responsibility, and I, I did it. I took a little bit of heat. I think it was worth it, though. I mean, oh, of course. I thought I thought when I said no to that that uh, I was never gonna, you know. I mean, the UFC was not gonna be interested in me, you yeah. know, anymore. But at the same time, it was like, well, this this was this is what's best for me, you know. Yep. Like if that means I have to have a few more fights, and maybe I could get called back at, at a later date. That's fine. You know, but how was it been in the house? It was boring. <laughs> that is like, like the, they that give, is the they give you all liquor, right? They give you all liquor and because they, they want entertainment. This, this is what they do with you. You know, they there is no television in the house. There's no 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 music. There's no cell phones. There's no newspapers. There's no books. Nothing, okay. Why no so, books? There no books. Nothing. They they don't want you. They do not want you separating yourself from the group. You know, I mean, uh, there's no doors on your. Uh, there is no doors on the bedrooms, and there's maybe a, there's one door for the bathroom. There's video cameras on you in the house everywhere, so they film you. You know, even in the bathroom. Yeah. So even you're taking a dump or you're pee pissing, you know, they're filming you do that as well. So, but yeah, it's funny. They, they don't, they don't want you uh, separating yourself from the people, other guys there. You know, in fact, you're so bored that the only entertainment you get is from being around the other guys. Yeah. So what they're doing, but you know, you're sharing, basically it's four guys to a bedroom too. You know, uh, there's one fridge. So you got 14 
guys sharing one fridge, one washing machine, one dryer. You know, it's like, you know, they, they set this up so that there's maximum tension. Yeah. <laughs> Got a you gotta fight a guy and you're you're looking at him every day. And then I just seen one on Matt Brown the other day where the guy put uh lime juice in his in his dip. <laughs> <laughs> and then Mac Brown knocked him out in the first round. But That's, yeah. Is there any note of who's in the who's in the house with you? I know Court McGee was in the house with you. Court McGee, uh, there's Casey Escola, Jamie Yeager, Chris McRae, uh, Seth Bazinski. Um there was a few other guys. Uh uh Chris Camozzi, he was in the house, so I don't know if he's still fighting with the UFC. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, I really, I would say probably Seth Bazinski. He was probably the most. He beat known. Kimbo, right? Well, did no Seth Seth Bazinski never fought Kimbo. He oh does. no, 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 Seth Bazinski. Okay, now, now I know you're talking about. I know you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Seth. Um, he was a funny, like probably the most alpha male guy in the house. He was the <laughs> he was the funniest guy in the house by far. I mean, he just he just sit around, he clown everybody, but. You know, I, I found they didn't give him a lot of screen time for some reason. You know, I thought that uh, they kind of focused on other guys, but yeah. from my view of it, you know, like, uh, you know, Seth was kind of where all the action was, but, uh, you know, they, they have the cameras on a bunch of other people, right? So I, yeah. I think a good TV and I don't know. It was just, it was weird because eh? there was so much that was going on in the house that... Um, never got filmed or didn't uh, didn't get emphasized, right? So I mean, you know, they, you know, they they got to make an episode out of basically twenty minutes of footage, so they got to tell a story. Yeah. So another story, however they want to. I mean, they've got they've got hours and hours and hours, but you know, they gotta they gotta make this bite size, you know, for the public, yeah. you know, to fit basically twenty minutes of a story, and then you got like maybe twenty minutes of fighting. So, yeah. you know, I just tell the real thing. So getting back to the UFC, signing that UFC deal, gratitude when yeah. that happened? Yeah. I was grateful. You know, I, um, I was grateful to be there. You know, I did my best. Uh, you know, and for me, though, when it was over, it was over. I was like, okay, hey, you know, like I've just had enough of this. Like, I don't even really view it as that, that big of a deal. Like, it, it is a big deal. But, you know, I mean, it just seems to me like it's just kind of a, it's just like kind of one chapter of my life, you know, no. and I, I'm just doing other stuff right now. It's That's just, how I felt about it, too. When I was done, I was done. It was kind of like one of those things that kind of came and went. Almost feels like a different life lifetime uh, to think back back to it and, and everything. What was your toughest fight? I I would say the court one was probably right up there. In Calgary? In Calgary, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a war. Oh, yeah. No, he, he beat me up. You know, it was very tough. Uh, I've had a lot of I've had a lot of tough ones, though. I mean, where, uh, I don't know, they're all, they're all a little bit different, right? I just felt like I got beat up a lot in that fight. You know, it was, uh, like, it was a war. Um, yeah, I don't know. Who'd you fight in Vancouver? I fought. What's his name? Um, I can see his face. I can't think of his name. James something. Uh, was his name James? I'm not sure. He went on to. Who did he fight after? He fought some big. He he kind of grew after that, right? I, oh. I, I, you beat him, I believe. Um, it was the one where you told me he knocked you out in the first round. <laughs> yeah. All right. You yeah, said, he dropped me, and I was unconscious, I, I felt. But, uh, yeah. I, but you like, won I the fight. I don't remember any of the fight after that, but it was the second round. Uh, I got him with a rear naked or something like that, a rear naked choke. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, I was completely knocked out for the probably 20 minutes. Like, I, I don't remember anything. I was like, I remember I was standing there and I was fighting, and then the next thing I remember is I was walking down a hallway, and uh, some guys – you know, pulled me into a room and they wanted to drug test me. That was about it. You know, but I had done a full interview. Um, I, I, I did the uh, medical examination, which I passed. 
<laughs> really? I was completely, you know, I, I mean, I watched the interview after and, you know, I'm just giving like these, uh, these answers that probably I've given a thousand times before, you know, like, uh, like I'm not even thinking, I'm, I'm not even really awake at this point. Right. So yeah, that was a little weird, but I had that happen one other time where, you know, same thing. I just remember, uh, you know, I was fighting and then I just remember they're raising my hand. Right. So, I mean, just what I'm talking about with this whole autopilot thing is yeah. like if they're, um, you're not always going to be conscious. Like uh, there's going to be like large gaps. You know what I mean? Is that common? Yeah. If you, if you get hit, you gotta, your body's got to have like the muscle memory to, you know, kind of keep going. I mean, but when you see guys get dropped in the in the UFC now, is that a common thing for them to go on autopilot and to lose memory like yeah. that? Yes, like I, I would say, uh, I, I would say there's lots of times where guys, uh, you know, they get hit, they don't know where they're at, and you know they'll lose like little little pieces of time, you know, but they're still in the fight. Yeah, yeah, I think that's actually very common, you know. Like usually, like when you remember a fight, you're you're only remembering little, little uh, flashes, you know. Like okay, I remember doing this. You know, you'll not have two more two minutes of your life. You'll remember these little uh, flash points, though. And I mean, the rest of it is just you're you're full so full of adrenaline that you, you can't remember. You don't even know where you are really. So when you go back and watch a fight, it's like it's like seeing it for the first time. Um, yeah you'll be like oh i remember that now or i remember that part but like yeah because you're so focused that it's just i don't know i only remember you know maybe it, say it was a 15 minute fight i might remember you know maybe three or four little snippets of that fight i don't remember the whole flow i mean i've got entire fights i i have not even watched right so oh, wow like it's just you know it's kind of over and I don't care anymore. So yeah. Do you watch the UFC now? I sometimes watch, you know what? We, we got one guy in our gym uh, named Hakeem. Yeah, I know. Hey, that, hey, that man is special. I will watch, I will watch his fights. Um, and then if there's like another good fight, if there's like, I don't know, some, something everybody's talking about, like I'll watch, I, I only watch maybe one or two uh, UFCs a year though. You know what okay. I mean? I just uh, I kind of want to just support my uh, support my friends. Yeah. Other than that, I'm not I'm not super interested. Yeah. Well, what was your? Because I'm pretty sure that you watch. Did you watch a lot when you fought or when you were going to fight? I watched my opponents. So I, you know, I wasn't a I was never a big MMA fan. Okay. You know what? I uh, I would watch my opponents. You know, and then come up with a game plan. And then the rest of the time, that was just me training. But, you know, honestly, I was never into the whole um, trash talking. You know, I wasn't into the – I don't think I was really uh, into the MMA culture so much. Yeah. For me, it was a little bit more of a job. I was never a big football fan. That's pretty cool. Really? Yeah. I was – I just – I love competition. And I just seen that as the – kind of the vehicle yep. that gave me the best competition. I understand. And, and you know, when you when you get to compete against the best in the world, it's like that's a gratifying feeling because now you know where you can place yourself in the world. Right? Just like you said earlier, um, with the purity. Um, just being able to compete at such a high level gives you that where you can actually place yourself. Yeah. Of how badass you really are. You well, know, I know like yeah, you know, if you try hard, you can get pretty far. You know, like, not everybody's going to be a world champion, right? Yeah. You know, and that's like, I think when you're younger, you're like, well, you know what, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do great things. But what I like about this is, you know, you can, you can try hard. I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get everything you want, right? Yeah. But, you know, you're a better version of yourself. You know, like, in fact, you know, you're the best version of yourself because if you gave it your all, you know, and you tried really hard and, uh, you know what, the chips, they're going to fall where they're going to fall. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you just have to be happy with that. Right. Yeah. I'm very happy with what I did. I like, it was, uh, 
it was something I wanted to do and it was uh, something nobody in my family had ever done. You know what I mean? Like this is, this is a great thing for me. And honestly, there's just so many good skills that come out of being an athlete, you yeah. know, they, discipline they, and they flow out yeah. other areas of your life. Right. Yeah. Like I feel really bad for the kids that, uh, you know, don't play sports and, you know, they don't, they don't really learn what their limits are. I mean, they're almost like delusional on what they think they can do. You know, like when you're an athlete, uh, you know exactly what Yeah, you push yourself and you do things that you don't think you can do. Did yeah. you ever go into a fight thinking, I don't know if I can beat this guy? You've always got that in the back of your mind, you know, but um, see, everybody's got doubt. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't play in those waters though. It's just like, you know, I focus on how I can beat the guy. Yeah. You know, what would I have to do to beat the guy? And I don't dwell on the outcomes at all. I remember just, you had texted me one time and you were talking about Uriah Hall. You said, I think I'm about to fight Uriah Hall. Yeah. Instantly I got scared for you. He's, you know, that guy, he's very good. He's a very good fighter. They uh, they canceled the, the, that one on me. Yeah. It was over a visa thing. Yeah. You know, like... I didn't get scared for you because I didn't think you could beat him. I got scared because he's so explosive. Right? I've know, seen you fight wars. Right? And it's just like, if you get into a war with that guy, it's, it's not going to be good. Right? So you know that's what? my thinking of it. It's a, it's a funny one on that one because the way he is, is he is so explosive, you know, and if he hits you, he's going to knock you out, right? In that kind of a fight, um, you know, that's that's not the way I'm built. Yes. You know, I've, only, I've really only got one choice, you know, and that's to draw it out, draw yeah. it out, draw it out, right? You know, but can you weather the storm? I mean, can you, uh, can you manage to not get hit for long enough? You know, and, you know, start getting your shots in. You know, I kind of look at a guy like, uh, you know, Nate Diaz, Nick yep. Diaz, like all them guys. So, Nate Diaz, he's also not, he's not an explosive kind of no. guy. He's only got, he's got one thing that he's really good at, and that's just kind of drawing a fight out. and Punches and know. punches and drawing fights out, gas Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, I mean, each fighter's got a, they've got their own little, I guess uh, they're their best path forward, right? So yeah. you're right. Oh, I mean, yeah, I've got no illusions about beating him or anything, but you know, it just uh, you know, like uh, how how are you like how are you going to do it? You know, I mean, yeah. this is just uh, a game plan against a guy like that. I mean, basically, you, you got to not 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 get tagged. Yeah, you know, uh, keep your distance or or smother like. One yeah, or the you gotta go forward, but he, he's just a—he's a special athlete, right? Yeah, you know this is uh this is not something that you're just gonna. Yeah, I don't know. You're just there's not a lot of guys that can beat him. You know, he's what I mean? very Anderson-like. What uh, what has happened with his career lately? I I haven't even seen. Has he I been... see that he uh, he just got called out by Anthony Pettis and he accepted the fight, but I don't know well, if the UFC is going to go through with it. I mean. Pettis moving up to 185 to fight Anderson Silva. Like, Anderson's 43. Are you talking about Anderson Silva or uh, Uriah Hall? Oh, no. I was talking about Anderson Silva. Um, I don't I, know. I, Uriah Hall won his last two fights, I believe. Um, I haven't. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, he's, he's, he's been around. Has he fought this year or last year? Um, I think he's got a fight coming up soon. Um, so, I, I got to see. I don't know what he's up to. Yeah. I haven't been following the sport a whole lot lately. But. Yeah. Who was the guy that you fought – or you were supposed to fight, but you got pneumonia at the, with your that weight was, cut? Uh, Tiago, right? No, his name was – he was training out of uh, Matt Serra's gym. Who was that? And he was, he was the Greek guy. Uh, he had the mustache, the bald head. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. And he was – he was pretty big for a little while there. Yeah. Man, that's – see, to me, like, that's why I get crazy. But, like, I look at it like this. When you tell me, 
like you're going to fight Uriah or some of those guys. It's not that I don't think you can win. It's just like, man. But then if somebody's like, could you go up against Deion Sanders or somebody? I'm like, yeah, I can, I can win my match. I can win my uh, battles, right? So I see it in the same way. I just see fighting so different. Like when you say the purity, right? You can get hurt. I can't get hurt going against the best DBs. But you can get hurt really badly going up against the best fighters. And you can prove that you're one of the best fighters. So it's a high risk, high reward situation. How did you look at that, though? Like, did you, like, I know you said it's in the back of your mind, the dangers of fighting anyone. But you, you wake up on the, the morning of the fight. Was there ever a day that you were just like, I don't know if I want to do this? Well, that's like basically every time. Really? Yeah, yeah. You, you do it anyways. So you force yourself to do it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know what, man? Like, that person, that person is there to kill you. Okay? Are you going to let that happen? No. <laughs> Block that. You know what? You're going to go in there, and you're going to murder that guy. Like, and you just do it however you have to. You know? Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, like, seriously, you're on the battlefield. You know, you're not going to back down. You're going to get this, you're going to get this shit done. You know, and I mean, everybody's counting on, on you. You know, I mean, this person, he's, he's there to kill you and he's going to kill your family. I mean, like, this is, this is yeah. it. And yeah. you have to do it like that, right? The Bible no the fittest. Like, yeah, you, you don't back down and you don't quit. Like, this is, this is it. I mean, you might, you might get murdered, <laughs> but you're, you're going you're to go down fighting. You have to. Nobody ever finished you, right? No. I've I've had my I have had my fucking ass kicked though. <laughs> but you never got finished. You lost all four by decision. I, I have not no, I've not been finished, you know, but I mean yeah, no, I've uh I've uh, I've been beat up. I mean I have I've not been finished, no. Dude, that's awesome. Do you do you take that as a victory? I guess. You know, I don't like losing at all. It, it it very much makes me mad, but yeah. What do you do? You know, I mean, yeah. Like you're gonna give your best. It's not always gonna work out. Yeah. Like that's fine. I mean, I'm just I'm I'm. Like it's a victory. It's ten out of ten when you go in there in the first place. Yeah. You know, I mean, how many people have the balls to do that? There's not that many. So uh, you just got you got to take that as a victory right there. Well, hey, like you're facing your fears every time, and you're. You know, despite how painful it is, you're going to do it. You know, I mean, this is, this is part of manhood. This is what you need to be doing. And you know what? I, I, I wish more kids would participate in sports anyways because, I mean, it, it it bounds them to reality. You know, yeah. like they, 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 they don't have any illusions on how good they are because uh, <laughs> they, they know. They you know, definitely know. So it just, all exposes your weaknesses. I was looking on here. I just looked up. It was James Head in um, in Vancouver. Uh, that's right. And you finished him. Um, also, the Tim Bowes fight. I thought you won that two to two to one. Well, it was a. I remember the first round I had won, and I went back to my corner and I, I couldn't breathe anymore. You know, it was uh, that was in Denver, right? Yeah. So it was just the elevation. The elevation killed me. Like I think I could have won that, but you know. He did uh, – I'm Tim sorry. Had, Tim had moved out there like a few weeks prior, like just yep. to acclimatize. It was a funny thing, but uh, Tim Bosch, he had a fight with Matt Hamill in Denver, Colorado as well. And that was a couple of years before I fought him in Denver, Colorado. Yeah. But when Tim, bought, Tim fought Matt Hamill, he gassed out because I think he – you know, he wasn't used to the elevation. You know, when I fought Tim, I came out there and I wasn't used to the elevation. You know, it was a big, uh, it was a big difference, big difference, right? Yeah. Well, that was a good trip down memory lane, man. I I really enjoy you coming through and and just talking about, you know, your fighting career. I know you left it behind, and you know, it might bring back some old memories and yeah, um, and, and sharing some of the stories. That, you know, one of the special moments pro you probably was having Bret Hart walk you out in Calgary. I loved it. Yeah. That had to be great. And then I felt like you were Rocky. 
right? You got Bret Hart walking you out. Um, you get down to the ring. You you go through that war. I almost got kicked out of the arena because they kept telling me to sit down. And I was <laughs> like, <laughs> both of you guys were gassed. And you were just sitting there throwing everything you had, just punching <laughs> each other in the face. Uh, a true war, man. And, you know, it just goes to show of your heart and – and what you've done, man, and, and what you continue to do after to help so many people um, conquer their fears, man. That's that's a huge fear for people to to fight. Absolutely it is. You know, um, I'm, I'm really happy with the new guys, you know, that are coming up the ranks, too. I mean, you know, we've got that. we got Hakeem right now. He's our, he's our new, he's our new, I guess, he's our new uh, He's a fighter. star. He's a star. He, He's a star, and you know what I mean? Yeah. It's going to be the same with him. Like, when his career ends, you know, he's going to have a lot to give to the new generation as well. You know what I mean? So, yeah. just comes right up through the uh, right up through the ranks, right? Yeah. Is there anything that you would say to anyone who wants to get into fighting? Anything they should know getting into it or, you know – they, anything they need to understand about it. Like if I'm like, a, if I'm an 18 year old or a 16 year old and I'm watching UFC, I'm like, I want to get in the UFC. Is there anything that you can help them skip some hurdles? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, first of all, the guys that get into the UFC, they want to get into the UFC. They've watched entirely too much UFC. <laughs> you know, they, <laughs> you know they, 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 they see the glamour, they see the lights, every, all the cameras on them and blah, blah, blah. And, like, I, I find a lot of guys like that. They're, they're kind of chasing the stardom. You know, that's not the right, that's not the right approach. I mean, what you want to do is you want to get into martial arts. You, you need to become a martial artist, okay? You're going to do low-level fights where you're not getting paid very much or if, it, if anything, and you just need to get used to that idea. you you got to have the mentality that, hey, I'm just here to get better at martial arts, you know? You know, you got to, like, hone your craft, you know, become a good fighter, become a good martial artist. You know what? Those fights will start winning themselves, you know? And when you start winning fights, I mean, this is where, this is where places like the UFC are going to start calling you and all, all the big promotions. I mean, they, 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 want, uh, they want stars like you, right? But, you know, unless you've uh, focused on being a good martial artist, martial artist first, it's, it's not going to happen for you, right? So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just just take a one fight at a time. You happy with everything? You happy where you're at now? I'm happy with where I'm at. You know, I uh, my life is a lot different, right? Uh, yeah. Oh, I mean, ever since I had my son, my uh, estrogen levels have gone way up. Right? <laughs> I don't, I don't have the killer instinct anymore. You if know? he says he wants to fight, what do you say? Um. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to, I, I would let him, yes. Uh, I would train him for a while. Like, I mean, honestly, I don't care if he has, I don't care if he becomes a big star or anything like that. But, you know, like as a man, he should have a few fights. Do you know what I mean? Because it's, it's really scary to get in there. It's hard. It's physically demanding. You know, it's painful. Like, this is everything that a boy needs to, they they need to experience this, right? Like I don't Did care. Be getting the ass kicked, Nick. Like, come on, man. Like, <laughs> hey, there's gonna be a lot of men watching this right now talking about. I don't know if I'm doing that. <laughs> <laughs> it has to happen. You have to do it at least a few times. You know, like beyond that, I don't really care. But like, you, you got to go through the hard stuff. You know what I mean? He goes through the hard stuff. You know, you'll be much better prepared to do a lot of other stuff. So, you know, yeah, I think, I think it's good for him. I think it would be. I mean, but again, if it's not his thing, he doesn't have to. Yeah. You know, he can do it a little bit, though. You know, just he needs to know enough to where he can protect himself. Yeah. On the I mean, that's a, that's a thing. I mean, when you're fight, like, if you've been in a few fights in the ring or in a cage, you you know exactly how to deal with like stress. Yeah. I mean, like you know how to manage your resources and everything, and do what's got to be done, even though you're scared. Yeah. You know, 
I see this happen with a lot of martial artists. I mean, they've been training martial arts for a long time, but the second they get into a street fight, you know, like they don't know how to deal with their emotions. They don't know how to deal with the energy expenditure. You know, they end up getting their ass kicked. You know, it's just, that's, a, that's not where you want to be. This is where competition is so important because, you know, I mean, uh, you know, nobody cares if you win or lose. I mean, they just, you know, they're there to rip your head off. You've, you, you got to bring it out. You know what I mean? There's no way to replicate that by doing drills. I mean, you, you got to do some competition as well, right? Yeah. This is, it makes you better. So and I mean, competition does make you better. And you know, one of the things you said was uh, the, the word scared. And I think that when people watch people fight, to know that that person's scared, like Mike Tyson saying he was terrified to walk to the ring. Right. Did you see that video? I think it was him and Teddy Atlas, but Tyson was, uh, he, he was like crying yeah. before fights. Yeah. He was Atlas, terrified. He had to walk him down kind of thing. Tyson goes out there and knocks the guy the fuck out, you know? It's, yeah. And, you know, like, that's Mike Tyson. I mean, that guy was a killer. He's coming back to fight. Did you see that video of him? Training? He he looks, looks, if you're over 50, he's killing you. <laughs> if you're over 40, you're going to the hospital. If you're over 30, you're going to get hurt real bad. And if you're, if you're under 30, your career is over. <laughs> you don't want to fight this man for four rounds. Especially if he's saying he's only going to fight four-round fights, right? So these are just like exhibition, four-round fights. He's going to hurt you really bad because he, he, he's not worried about gassing out. No. Well, like in a 10 round fight, he's 10, 12 round fight, he's got to be like, okay, I got to save a little bit. And four rounds? This dude about to hurt somebody. You, you, know what, you know how it is like with different eras of sport? Yeah. You know, like Mike Tyson, he was from an era of the sport where there was a lot of great heavyweights. Yes. You know, like there was, there was all sorts of them. I don't think there's been an athlete like Mike Tyson even since then. Not for the heavyweight division. No. There's been no one who explodes the same way he is. And, you know, like the guy was a – he was a stone-cold killer. You know, like he was there. He was literally just a predator. You know, he was there to – he was there to kill you. You know, he was yeah. going to knock you. You know, I, I don't see a lot of guys like that since. You know, I mean, he was a very special athlete. Like he's a one percenter for sure. He's 1% of 1%, really, you know? Who was your favorite fighter of all time? My, well, you know what? Mike Tyson was, was one of them. You know, I, uh, I really liked George St. Pierre, and I liked uh, Raymond Decker. So, Man, I, don't I don't know that name. Raymond Decker was a Dutch kickboxer. Okay. You know? But same thing. Very K-1? Ex- no, he, did, he fought in Thailand mostly. Okay. But, you know, you got to look him up. I you will. Know, Great kickboxing fights. Raymond Decker. You know, he's, uh, he's, he's not alive anymore, right? But Okay. Very good fighter. Well, I'm glad you're looking healthy, man. Thank you for the conversation, <laughs> Nick. I appreciate your generosity of coming on, man, and sharing your story, um, sharing everything about the UFC and, you know, even the political views and everything like that. Man, I'm much uh, – whenever we can talk to each other and have respect for each other, I believe we can get somewhere in life, right? Thank you. You know what? Like, uh, I've known you for a number of years now. I mean, like, it's, it's always been like this. You've always been so cool with me, you know? Like, yeah. I've, you know, I, I, I've enjoyed interacting with you, you know, like, basically ever since day one. And, you know, so, <laughs> you know growing up, I mean, you, you kind of view these athletes as if they're, like, special and stuff. And, yes, they are special, but, you know, like, honestly, like, you, you talk to these people, they're just, they're real human beings. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, they're normal people at the end of it. And I mean, it's just, that's one thing that just kind of blew my mind. I mean, like uh, when I first met you, I mean, you're, you're a big star, but I mean, honestly, you're, you're always so cool with me, you know? Yeah. Dude, do you remember the time we were at Roadhouse? I'd met you at Tantra, but we were at Roadhouse. And I was like, Nick, we should fight each other for charity. And you said, I don't know how to fight, fight for fun. <laughs> And I was like, charity match off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was like something. I- <laughs> I'm 
I'm like, Nick, you trying to kick my ass in front of everybody for charity? <laughs> That's not right, man. That's not right. But yeah, man, I, I truly appreciate it. I truly appreciate you coming through the Lulu Logic podcast, man. And, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I, I know did. I had a blast. Is there anything, uh, any, anybody would like to get involved with the fights there in Calgary or uh, get in contact with you about training or anything? Is there any way they can do that? Well, you know what? If you're interested in training, I mean, just come to Champions Creed. So we're on McLeod and 42nd. So that's the same building that you came to, yep. you know, with Ian. But, yeah, Champions Creed, I mean, we're, we're actually just opening up. I mean, so Monday's our first uh, day open, awesome. you know, after the whole COVID thing. So That's when this is going to air. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Well, come on out. I mean, uh, yeah, so I, uh, I coach there, you know, a couple of times a week. You know, take a class. Yeah. <laughs> yeah think, think. Bring bring your son in so he learn how to get his ass kicked so he can be more of a man. <laughs> 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 All right, brother. I appreciate you. Thank you very much.